Okay, <clears throat> welcome to thermodynamics. Um, there's uh, a series, uh, now that we've talked about properties, we've talked about states and all that, I've been talking about these engine cycles, let's remind ourselves. Uh, there's the Carnot cycle, which is the limit of how much efficiency you're, you're going to get out of an entire cycle. There's the isentropic process, that's the limit of how much energy you're going to get out of a particular process. Um, uh, auto cycle, gasoline engine, um, diesel cycle, compression ignition, Brayton cycle we're using for gas turbines, Rankine cycle is steam, and if you do it backwards, it's refrigeration. Basically, if you have a Rankine cycle, is something where phase change between liquid and vapor and at some point in the process when you're using that phase change energy, especially in the refrigeration side. side. Um, and we have examples on these and I started the example on auto cycle and we just kind of kept, today is the go through the examples thing. I, I like pre-did them to make sure I had them right. There's also going to be a posting not only of this like later on today but there's a, um, if I didn't already post it, I will be posting one about like a summary for all the cycles and all the, the isentropic uh, uh, air standard formulas and things like that. Uh, so, <clears throat> let's go to the um, auto cycle example to start with. So, and this probably is going to go blazing by faster than you can copy it down. So, apologies for that, but we will have it posted. Uh, for an auto cycle, we had a compression ratio, which was volume related. And it goes from original volume, and then the compression ratio of 8 to 1 means this volume is 1 eighth of that. And I think, yeah, that was an 8 to 1 compression ratio. It causes pressure, but it isn't eight times the pressure. It's one eighth of the volume. And when you do ideal gas and you compress it, the heat, it, you're, you're doing work on the gas. The gas gets hot, and now you're at one eighth the volume, but the gas got hot, and pressure is related to temperature and volume. And between the two of them, we'll go through what that does for you. But it comes over uh, an isentropic compression. And then a constant volume heat addition. That's what happens when the spark goes off and the fuel burns. But in this case, we're saying as much heat as the fuel gave you, we're just going to like let a heat exchanger exchange some heat to that air because we're just doing air in a circle. And when you put in that amount of heat at a constant volume, ideal gas law says it's going to go up to a new temperature and pressure. <coughs> and then. Um, well, actually, not ideal gas law. M the C sub V kind of delta T kind of, or actually in this case, this is a constant volume process, so it's going to be a C sub V specific heat, not C sub P. Say that again. There is specific heat. If, if you have the sort of the definition of specific heat for, especially for ideal gas, it doesn't really matter for liquids because they don't change volume. But if you have some, some gas and you put some heat into it and you keep it at the same volume, it's going to take um, so much energy to make it go up one degree in temperature. If, and when it does, it's going to raise pressure also because the ideal gas law says it's related. So the pressure will go up and the temperature goes up, and that's a constant volume specific heat. If you had a piston on there that, that kept it with a certain force, such that it's a constant pressure, and you put in the same amount of energy, then um, the pressure wouldn't rise. The pressure would stay the same, but the pressure, it, the, the piston would move, and that's doing not only energy, but work. And the so if, 
If you have that that constant volume, it would be like went up 10 degrees. And now you now if you let it expand to the back to the pressure, now it went down to eight degrees or something. <coughs> so if you put more heat in it to get up to temperature and it expands some more. So the C sub P constant pressure specific heat is going to be the amount of energy you put into the gas is going to be greater than if you keep it at constant volume and let the pressure go up. So they're, they're two different numbers. Um, and <clears throat> most processes you can use C sub P doesn't have to be a constant pressure process. If, if C sub P takes into account both the internal energy and the work that's being done, no matter how you do it. Um, if there's no work being done because only time work happens is if something moves. <clears throat> the specifics of the volume change. But if you have a constant volume, then uh, it's really only internal energy that the energy is going into, and that makes means you got a different pressure than it would be. Uh, so you use constant volume specific heat in the in the special case of a constant volume process. Most of the other the isotropic process is a constant pressure. But you can use uh, the constant the C sub P constant pressure specific heat for like everything except the constant volume because when it's in constant volume there's no work being done it's 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 all about the making the molecules move faster. So that's one of the one of the, the fine points here. And then you can figure out what that temperature is, and then it comes down with an isentropic. Uh, expansion, that's our power stroke, it ends up at some temperature and we can calculate that using the uh, the isentropic relationship, the stuff that has a, a relationship between temperature and um, pressure and volume with, with k's in the exponents. Those are, anytime you have a k in the exponent, that was an isentropic, derived from isentropic process. Um, and then it cools down and comes back here. And if you had a piston, it's like the piston's here, and now the piston moves up to there, and then the piston moves back to here. And going that way, you put work into it. Going this way, you're taking work out of it. Um, so I uh, filled in the table, and we'll go how I filled in the table here next. But in the table, it started off at Seven degree, 17 degrees uh, Celsius, which makes it 290 Kelvin, 273 plus 917. And it was at one atmosphere, 100 kilopascals. When you take it and you give it a compression, 8 to 1, it didn't, the pressure, did the pressure go up by a factor of, of 8? Pressure went up by a factor of 18. Temperature went from 2.9. Then this has to be both, both of these always have to be absolute values. Uh, temperature went up, you know, 370. Yeah, 376 degrees Kelvin, which is also 376 degrees centigrade. Degree size is the same. 376 centigrade. That's hot. I mean, you know, 100 degrees centigrade is boiling. So that's like, you know, roasty toasty. That's kind of, you know, you can put some turkey in an oven that's this hot. It's, it's, cooked. it's cooked. It's gone. Because <laughs> that's like 600 or 700 degrees Fahrenheit or something, you know, five or 600. Um, and so um, temperatures are really all we need. We can, we, the, the, the pressures are for academic interest. Golly, how much pressure was it? But, but because our change in enthalpy for ideal gas is all about temperatures, it's a C sub P or a C sub V times a change in temperature gives you a change in enthalpy. If we can chase the temperatures around the cycle, that's all we need to do for the air standard cycles. Uh, but I filled in all the rest of it. And values for entropy, I really don't care except from one to two. I, I, I know that this value is the same as it's an isentropic process, which means we have these kind of formulas. Uh, it's really a ratio of temperatures equals the ratio of volumes to the K minus one. And the ratio of pressures is the ratio of volumes to the K factor. So this R is a 
a volume ratio. Um, and then for the next trick, um, they said we add 800 kilojoules of energy to, um, so I just added 800. That's what the combustion was. That was a stated thing. How much fuel did you use? It was enough. It was 800 kilojoules per kilogram of air. Um, so I just added 800 to this. No calculation involved there. But the question was, um, how did I find the temperature? We'll, we'll do that one. Um, because I needed that temperature to find my final temperature. So this was, and then once I found the temperature, I also went back and found the, uh, the pressure. And it's getting up there at 44 atmospheres. Um, and then, um, again, from 3 to 4 S, that was a isentropic expansion. You know, again, what was isentropic? Well, it's an ideal gas. Or it's an ideal reversible. It happens really slowly, and you, you don't disturb anything while it's going. But the main thing is it's insulated, so there's no heat added. There's, it's not losing any heat. All of the transformation happens from energy within the fluid itself. The temperature, the pressure and the temperature are, are turning into volume, essentially. The temperature drops, the pressure drops, um, and it gets bigger. And all that happens, and the, it's the, the, it turns into work. So, and again, for the it's an isentropic process when it expands. So, this is the same formula as this one, except it's reversed because it's the final state is expanded. I mean, it, it's it's just this is in the denominator now instead of the numerator because this is uh, a volume of um, T or volume four over volume three, and so this has to be four over three. Or I don't know anyway. That's it's, this is a denominator now because it's expansion instead of compression. And same for the pressure. <clears throat> Up here it was multiplied by it, down here it's divided by it as we're reversing the process. <clears throat> so, for step finding uh, state two from state one, state one was all givens. Um, temperature is what we really wanted to know, and we did calculate this before, but to start off at 290 degrees with a um, expansion value or compre um, compression ratio of 8 to the K minus 1 ended up with 666.2 degrees Kelvin. Um, I keep all the extra digits and round them at the end. That, that saves on rounding errors. And then for pressure, same deal, only now it's the ratio R to the K, not the K minus 1, um, and end up with the value that we got there. Um, the difference in enthalpy is C sub P times the difference in temperature. Um, and here's the trick here. Now, a lot of in the book, especially, they were using. Uh, when they developed the formulas, it was all developed assuming a constant value for C sub P and, and K and C sub V. They, they had a, a value that they just said, we're just going to use this value and take it around there. I, I did I changed things a little up a little bit in that um, I looked for the temperature range that we're dealing with and took a C sub P value that was, uh, or in this case, yeah, C sub P value uh, that was um, averaged to the, the two data points in the, um, the table that were close to the values I was using. And that came up, I have a C sub P value of this much for air times this temperature difference gave me a value for H. I, another trick was uh, H1, I know that's going to be the lowest value, and I could 
could go find what that value was relative to, you know, absolute zero, but then it just complicates things. So, like they did in all of your tables, I, at some point I'm going to call it zero and build everything on top of that. So what I did was I called my inlet temperature. I said that's my reference. I'm going to call it zero. Is it really zero? No, there's there's energy there already, but it's the lowest point in the cycle. I'm just going to call it zero because then I can just say this calculation that became my H2S ideal. Um, so that's where uh, those numbers came from. For we've got H1, we're given H2, we just calculated. Um, Values for state three. It's a constant volume process. Um, temperature, temperature, so the amount of heat we add is C sub V times is delta temperature. I know this value. I know this value. I just calculated it. Um, I can pick this one off the charts, and this is the only unknown. If I solve for this one, I get T2 plus the ratio of the heat over T to V, which gave me a value of 1602. I think you might have calculated that one last time, too. Uh, again, the number I picked for here, I'm using this one for 1,000 degrees Kelvin because that's in that ballpark. Um, actually, if you have to put these two together, it comes up like 1,100 Kelvin. That would have been the midpoint, would be an average value. But the table only went up to 1,000. So, um, and likewise, if we go the, because it's a constant volume, um, we can use ideal gas law directly. And where did I? There we go. If you look up. Uh, up here for this prop, PV equals nRT. If if it's a closed system, n stays the same. R is a constant. If the volume stays the same, then all those three are constants. And if I group them together, temperatures and pressure are going to vary. Um, if it's P over T equals nR over V, then P over T2 equals P over T3. And I can, uh, oops, where did I? Yeah. So that's what's all going up, up in this corner. So that says, now that I know the temperatures, uh, I can figure out the pressure. And because the pressure rose that much, it, uh, it's because the energy was coming in. If the pressure rose that much because of the energy coming in, then the temperature had to rise that much. And uh, then my H, I just added the energy they told us we had to the value we had. And now I have a new value for, now we got state three. We only got one more straight to go. So for state four, it's another isentropic uh, relationship. And uh, this time we're dividing by R to the K minus 1. Um, and 1602 divided by that gives us 697. The pressure divided by R to the K value gave me 240 kilopascals. And change in enthalpy. Now, now here's a trick. Instead of finding enthalpy from the point before and coming back, I'm going to take it from the constant volume um, process that it's it's going to have to cool off back to where it started. So I'm going to go like backwards on my cycle now because it's easy. Well, mostly because I don't have a good data for those temperatures on my C sub P. I could do a C sub P times the temperature difference from that high temperature, high pressure. It should give me the same result, but I don't have data up there. <coughs> Take it from uh, my exhaust back down to this uh, 
starting point of the cycle and the C sub V. We defined that as a constant volume process. Um, and so the same number there and those different, and I get, um, and it also helps here my H1, again, was, we're going back to my reference point, which was zero, so um, I get 348.2 kilojoules per kilogram. Um, and that, as much as anything else, aside from its, um, it, yeah, it was just easier to do it that way. <clears throat> so, um, now that we have some data, we filled out the, the table there, and so now I know um, my you know my H values. If I can find H values, that's usually all I need to do. So if I want to find the net work that was done in the cycle, the work in is H2S minus H1, that's that. I had to put that much work in, and that's um, 0 to 385.6. The work out was this much. Um, work out is the H3 minus H4S. which H3 minus H4S gets me, there's 11.85 minus 348.2. Give me, I have 837 to work out. My network, um, if the difference between these two numbers, power pistons doing this much work, compression pistons sucking some out of it. Um, <coughs> And then the 451.8. <clears throat> and if you divide these two, um, the energy in was a given, that was 800. <coughs> and if you divide those, you get 56.5% efficiency. Um, if you, it doesn't always work out this neatly, but uh, this time it did. Because <clears throat> I was jacking around with the C sub Vs. I wasn't using constant values necessarily for the same temperature for everything, but uh, I got that number. If you do this, which they, they simplify all this stuff and they can say, uh, basically took all these, all these basic formulas, used a constant value. 1 minus 1 over R to the K minus 1 is the overall efficiency for the cycle. So we use 8? There. Use 8 in here and K is 1.4 minus 1. And that calculates out to 56.5%. <clears throat> There's also um, Carnot efficiency. That was like the absolute thermodynamic limit of any cycle. Um, that's like a totally reversible fabulous engine that no one's been able to make, but it's it's a limit, and it's at uh, close to 82%. So we could say this has, you know, whatever percentage of Carnot, and the closer you get to Carnot, you know, you say, oh, this is only 56% efficient. Maybe it's really 85% efficient compared to, you can't get better than that as a heat engine. Um, but how, are there things we can do that, that could make it better. So for instance, in uh, our exhaust, I figured out that the exhaust was coming out at 240 kilopascals, which is two and a half atmospheres worth of pressure. Um, it could go down to one atmosphere worth of pressure. That's why you have mufflers on your cars, because without mufflers, it's loud, right? It's those pressure pulses when they open the exhaust valve. What if you could make that pressure pulse go down to zero when you open your valve, no big deal. It would just you just push the, the, the piston could push the exhaust out, but you could you could expand. What if what if your compression stroke did what your, whatever your compression stroke is? What if your expansion stroke expanded to the point where you could take that pressure all the way down? So uh, these are the sort of things that that keep me up late at night. <laughs> what if? How about that? So. Um, Mm -hmm. 
what if the exhaust valve, uh, so the question is, what value of R would give us 100 kilopascals? Um, such that the P, P4S becomes 100 kilopascals from whatever, from P3 to P4. And I just re solved this equation for that, and it came up with an expansion ratio of 14.9. So if you could compress 8.5 and, and expand 14.9, and then you you could have you wouldn't need a muffler. Think of all the all the the weight you could say, right? But how in the heck do you make an engine that compresses this much and expands that much? It seems counterintuitive. Uh, and by the way, still the temperature would there be waste heat? We've gotten all the pressure out of it, but when you do this with that for the waste heat, uh, the temperature comes down. Let's see, what was it? Yes, uh, temperature was 673, almost 700. Temperature came down to 543 kilojoules um, on the outlet. Is that much? And if you do the numbers, now we could get, here's the, we had the same compression engine, uh, compression wheel, and that went from this high energy at the top of the uh, power stroke to a lower energy at the bottom of the power stroke, still put in the same amount of energy. Um, the only thing that changed was this number because we were able to, able to expand it. We got 73% um, efficiency on the cycle instead of 56. But, you know, how in the heck to do that? Turns out, we do that. Um, there's something called Atkinson cycle, and if you look up um, Hondas and Toyota uh, um, hybrids and Ford hybrids, they'll actually say Atkinson cycle engine. Um, how do they do it? If you have, if your piston still only goes as far as it goes, but what if you leave the intake valve? If you, sucked in a bunch of intake, and then it, it, you let it, the intake go back out, and then you close. It make the piston come back, back halfway before you close the intake valve, and then you compress it 8 to 1, and when you expand it, you let it expand all the way, and then you do your exhaust stroke, suck it all in, half of it goes out. Um, you can do that, and you can get much higher efficiency. That's why they do it in the hybrids. But that efficiency is lower. Say again? That efficiency is lower. Did we get 82 the first time? Oh, no, no. First time was 56. Oh, okay. 82 was... So the overall. The 82 right. was like the limit. That, that was the... That was the car no efficiency for engine that no one's ever been able to make. That's a thermodynamic theoretical limit. We're getting a heck of a lot closer to that from 56 to 73. We were able to take it all the way down. Now you don't even have you don't need a muffler, or you know. Um, the, so what? What is it? Oh yeah. yeah, because if you had a two-liter engine, but now you're only using half of basically the amount of fuel air mix you have, you're only going to use half of the volume of that engine. Uh, if your two-liter engine made 200 horsepower, now it's only going to make 100 horsepower, but it's going to do it very efficiently. What's the pitch? And what's the extra? What about the echo boost? That's just well, no, there's 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 more than twin turbo. There's <laughs> eco boost. Um, I'm not entirely sure. If it's on the, if it's like a Ford hybrid or something. The new Ford GT, the 16 that just came out. Oh. It's going to be like that, but it's going to be super powerful. Yeah, I don't know about EcoBoost with that. Uh, there's, there's one of the things they're doing is direct injection, which, which allows them to do higher compression, and that also increases efficiency. So, you know, there's, there's more. If you keep pulling these tricks out, I, I thought that the, there, you know, 20 years ago that there wasn't much they could do to internal combustion engine, but. You can get a lot more efficiency by doing this is with the same compression ratio. Imagine you do that and now you jack up the compression ratio. 
You can't jack up the compression ratio if you have a fuel-air mixture because it's going to pre-ignite with the temperature gets high enough. But if you direct inject the fuel, you just bring in air, compress the air, then put in fuel and spark. Um, there's even room for more uh, improvement. So that's how the auto cycle goes. And you're saying to yourself, golly, that was fun. That was so much fun that let's do another one, you say. And who, are, who am I to argue with that? Diesel cycle. <clears throat> and now this one, that one, I think the numbers match what's in the book pretty close, even though I, I jacked around with the, um, the, the C sub P's, and they weren't constant, and they weren't, you know, what the book's doing in some of these is using uh, room temperature values and just doing everything at room temperature values, which helps calculate it, makes things more stable. Um, on the diesel cycle, I didn't get so lucky to match what the book's doing. They did a really different way of, that I don't, we don't need to confuse ourselves with. Um, so, I'm in the ballpark, but I'm not matching their numbers exactly. Um, in a diesel cycle, it's also a compression is volume related. And we have the same formulas. It's going to be isentropic compression. And then um, Q in a constant pressure um, power. Um, and the only way you can maintain pressure if something's moving is by adding heat. Because as it's moving, the volume goes down. To keep pressure stays up, the temperature also has to go up uh, to maintain the pressure as the volume goes up. So uh, we can do the C sub P on a constant. That, that truly is a constant pressure process. Well, how much heat needs to go in to maintain that pressure? Um, but it's also doing work while it's doing it, so we're going to not, it, and it's, it's separating the work and the heat and all that. Um, we're going to do a, a trick on this one and, and do an end run around it by just saying net work equals heat in minus heat out. So we take the heat in, subtract the exhaust, and say what was left was the amount of work that it did. Because this is kind of, it's all bundled in there, but it's true, the amount of heat going in is going to be C sub P. Um, I'm changing temperature, and we can figure out that temperature. Um, so, what do we know? Inlet, uh, one atmosphere, and this one's now this one's not metric. This is English, um, and 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which makes it 540 Rankin. So on this one again, we have two isentropic. Uh, Deals and we have a constant pressure and a constant constant volume going on this process here. What do you want to change to uh, Kelvin? So I'm just wondering, just sort of by rank from Fahrenheit. You could do uh, Fahrenheit to. You could take change it into Kelvin if you want, but but this is just doing English units. Um, just easier, to just basically. Well, just to show that it can be done either way. Gotcha. You'd have to convert everything. To run it, I mean, you know, convert all your stuff, and this way we just you use it. So it's less conversion. Um, so we got two isentropic processes: the constant volume on the exhaust again, constant pressure up top. That's the burn. So, and in this case, we have one more thing: our cutoff. Um, we injected fuel, and it started to burn, and it stopped burning when the volume doubled. That's what that means. So. You know, this is the clearance volume, and when the piston had moved far enough that it was equivalent to uh, the volume, we doubled that that volume. That we call it cutoff volume. That's really saying how much fuel did we put in. If this kept going farther, uh, it would be burning longer. That means more fuel. If it was at an idle, this number would come way back to here, and it'd be just a little teeny tiny bit of fuel. So the amount of fuel we put in there is related to that number. So that's really telling us it's a clue for how much fuel did we burn. Um, step one, 
So, you know, what do we know? We know state one, it was given, it's our input. State two, uh, we got to calculate. And from state one to state two, that's the compression. Same deal. T temperature two S is the temperature one times the R for the compression times the K minus one, same formula, but this number's bigger. And now it's 716 degrees Rankin, which is, I don't know, some degrees Kelvin, whatever it is. And the pressure went up um, from 14.7, and now it's 18 to the 1.4, went up to 841 uh, PSI. Uh, this is hot enough to cause something to start to burn. And the work in the compression is H2S minus H1. I'm doing the same thing. My lowest temperature one, temperature pressure inlet. I'm just going to call that my reference value. Call it a zero. Is it zero? It's not zero, but for this cycle, we're going to measure everything from there. We're going to call it zero. <coughs> so, and for this, I use C sub P, uh, used to value at 1,000 degrees Rankin. Um, Splitting the difference between these two, but again, I'm off a little bit. 1700 plus 500 is like 22. It should be like 1100 would be the midpoint, so I'm not too far off. And I got 309 for that's state two from my next trick. State three, well, what do we know about state three? It's a constant pressure process. So the, product, the, the value is still the same. Um, just for grins, it's 57 times the input pressure is what that ended up at. And at state three, whatever the temperature was at temperature two, uh, we maintained the pressure, and so now we can, with the ideal gas law, uh, PV equals NRT, the pressure stays the same, the N and the R are the same, and now it's T's and V's are proportional. So that's where this comes from. Uh, T3 over V3 equals T2 over V2. I know this, and I know this. This is my cutoff. This is, at V3, it's twice as much volume as it is at volume 2. End of compression, and then we're going to double that volume. So that's my cutoff ratio. Uh, it comes up uh, 34, 32 degree Rankin. Um, from the top of compression, it got hotter. Does that make sense? We just put a bunch of fuel in there. Didn't have fuel before, so the temperature is going to rise. And if I want to find out how much energy I added, um, well, I want to find out what the value is at that point. Uh, H2 is the end of compression, what that H value is, plus the C sub P times the difference in temperature gets me, um, and I'm using the, the C sub P here at 2000 degrees Rankin, which is top, the, the, that's not. That's not really the average here, but it was as close as I could get because that's where the table ended. Um, and so I get a value of 800.1 BTUs per pound mass. Um, this value here is really how much heat was added. Because that's the next thing. I really want to know how much heat did I add in, in the fuel. So um, it's the same. It's just that that term there was C sub P times change in temperature was how much heat. Needed. That's how it maintained that that pressure as it was expanding. Um, and then state four. We're expanding. The, if the trick with diesel is the expansion ratio is not the same as the compression ratio because um, 
when you find the let it freely expand, perhaps it's done some work, but now it does the expansion. Um, it started off 18 to 1, so imagine you have 18 whatever units and go to 1 unit, and now we go to 2 units, and now it's expanding from 2 to 18. So it's a 9 to 1 expansion. So Say again? Almost like that on diesel. Yeah, and, and that varies on, depending on your throttle. If you, if you put more your foot in it, it's going to put more fuel in it, and then the, the cutoff ratio gets bigger and the expansion ratio gets smaller. And the cutoff ratio. Yeah, so your problems are always going to tell you here's your cutoff. Um, so yeah, we only have a 9 expansion ratio, so same formulas as before, but now we start out 841, but um, expand, it comes out at 38.8 psi, according to that, and the temperature, 1425, and um, an output uh, N enthalpy of 172.6. And you're saying, okay, but now what? So now we filled out the table. That's that's how we filled out the table. Now we got to use it. And one of the tricks, part of the issue with the diesel cycle is um, when the heat was going in, there was work going on. There was volume change going on. We, and this is all, you know, we don't know how big the volume was. So we're just going to avoid dealing with that by by using our there's a handy little trick here. If I want to know the net work that's done, if I know how much heat went in and I know how much heat went out, I can subtract them and that's the net work. The heat that's missing is the work that was converted. So I know that uh, in was the 490. Just figured that out from CCP delta T. Uh, that's what it had to be to maintain the pressure. Um, and out was uh, H4 minus H1. Uh, the exhaust heat essentially 172. And the difference between them, uh, that's how much net work was done. So next question is, what's the cycle efficiency? I get 318 divided by 490. It comes out about 65%. If you do... The formula for this, um, it comes off a little different. And the reason for that is I was jacking around with, I wasn't using one constant value for CCP, which if this was developed, assuming that it was a constant value at one temperature number. Um, and if you do the Carnot cycle, now we have temperatures. You can say that Carnot says it could have been 84% efficient, and we got 65, which was, uh, you know, the gasoline engine, we got like a 56. So um, just, you know, it runs more, if diesels run more efficiently, you fuel better. So. That was fun, wasn't it? Yeah. That was so much fun. In fact, I, 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 am I hearing, golly, let's do another one? Is that what I'm hearing? I thought so. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this, the thing is, this is your, you've got homework coming up, too, here. Yeah. There's, the lab today is not a tour. It's going to talk about what we've done if I had my act together and we'd been on a tour and if they didn't have construction going on and other stuff. Um, we're going to talk about what goes on in the, in the plant itself and, and take some data. And, and, uh, but it's not going to be a tour for a couple of different reasons. But we're going to, it'll, it'll go faster as a result. And, and hopefully make, the tour is neat because you, you feel the heat of the boilers that are, the boil, each, there's three boilers and each one's, like, take this room and put it on its side like that and that's pretty much what the boiler is. And it's, it's just, it's noisy, it's actually really hard, I always have issues with people not having enough 
like don't hear enough about what's going on because it's too loud. And anyway, that's the, the lab today. We're going to do it like that. That's lab time. Um, that's my excuse anyway. You gotta have an excuse, right? <laughs> Uh, same deal here of the Brayton cycles gas turbines. Um, TS diagram, it looks different. We have different things going on. Our R value now is not a um, volume ratio. It's an actual pressure ratio, which changes the formulas a little bit when we're doing an isentropic formula. We have a constant entropy here, constant entropy there, constant pressure and constant pressure in between. And so I sort of do little things and which point goes where. This is my lowest again. So um, now instead of like a k minus one factor, because this is not a volume ratio, it's a pressure ratio. Now it's a k minus one over k to get from t one to t two. And you'll notice um, we only want to uh, t two is eight. I don't really care. It doesn't matter if it's angular symmetric or what for the pressure. It's just a ratio. Um, and there's the high pressure side. It's eight times. Eight atmospheres, and in the low pressure side, this one atmosphere. Uh, temperatures go through that, and then um, using, I think it's all CCPs, with temperature difference. Again, if you chase the temperature around the cycle with formulas like this or with ideal gas, then you can chase the enthalpies around and how much work went in, um, how much energy. So, work going in is between one and two. Heat going in is between two and three. Work coming out is between three and four. And exhaust heat is from four to one. So that's where all those numbers come from. Since we've got uh, like seconds here, um, this is all CCPs and the chasing temperatures around. We're given the high temperature of 1300 degrees Kelvin, that's like based on materials, so things don't melt. Um, and the Q in was between 3 and 4. Q out is 441. Network difference between them. If you wanted to do it a different way, you could do the work network was turbine minus the compressor. And the turbine actually is turning a compressor in one of these as opposed to the steam plant pumps probably not being turned by the turbine directly, but we get to the same point we're using the same numbers. And the cycle efficiency on this network divided by QN and at about 48%. Compared to Carnot, about this much. All right, that'll do. See you for lab. This group fits the ideal. Uh, I'm just like, okay, then we're there with the